Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Back with us today is our favorite neuropsychologist, Dr. Christopher Howard, and we are going to be talking a little bit off of the normal topics today, but we're going to be talking about why African Americans don't like to go to the doctor. Hopefully we can make some suggestions on how to change that. So thanks for joining me again, Christopher. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So I know why I don't like to go to the doctor because it's just not real fun. You know, they weigh you and then they tell you you're overweight and then, you know, and you already don't feel good. So <laughs> that's my excuse. But um, you brought up this topic. So why do African-Americans not like to go to the doctor? Yeah. I, I can, Oh, well, once again, thank you for having me on your show. Like, I, I think we always have great conversations. And, you know, I share the same sentiments. Like, sometimes, like, when I go to the doctor, it's like, man. And I always, and I always joke with the nurse or whoever's, like, leading me to the back room. It's like, man, the worst part is standing on the scale and finding how much you weigh. Because it's like, no matter what you do, it's always a, like, you know, I can't make it go the other way. It's always going up. You know? But, yeah, you know, this is an interesting topic because one of the things that it's like putting different pieces of the puzzle together so that we can understand what's going on. Um, so one of the first pieces of the puzzle that we can look at is like, we recognize health disparities, right? We look at, we say African-Americans over the age of 20, 44% of the men, 48% of the women has some very form of uh, cardiovascular disease. African-Americans have developed Alzheimer's at a rate of two to three times, uh, you know, white individuals, um, birth complications during pregnancy, African-American women are like three times as high compared to other groups of people. But then it's just like, okay, well, if all these disparities persist, then it should almost be like us rushing down to get to the top. But that's not necessarily the case. And a lot of times people talk about, well, Tuskegee, Tuskegee, Tuskegee. I think the misconception with Tuskegee, and for the individuals who are unaware of Tuskegee, essentially what happened for like almost 70 years, um, individuals had syphilis and rather than receiving, uh, you know, cure for syphilis, they were just given a placebo because the American government wanted to see like, what would that be like if syphilis remained untreated? And what it did was this, not only did it create like a huge distrust with the medical system and the government or whatever the case may be, but it also substantiated beliefs that doctors are not good for people. And sometimes what we kind of are good for African-Americans. And so sometimes what you kind of run into is like uh, availability heuristics, right? Where, okay, uh, the neighbor down the street or the member at the church or whomever, they went to the doctor and they never came back right, right? So people start saying like, hey, you know, if you go to the doctor, you know, you're not going to come back normal and stuff like that. So that's one of the things that kind of perpetuated this whole notion of like not going to the doctor. But also sometimes what you kind of have to look at also it's just like in certain communities, right? Because America is still segregated and due to redlining. So I was reading an article and it was kind of interesting because what I was looking at was that the, oh, so well, before I go off on another tangent, so redlining <laughs> is like when individuals came back from World War II that banks wouldn't loan them different, or banks wouldn't loan African-American money. So they were relegated to one side of town where other groups of people were able to receive like money from the bank. And then you start seeing like the proliferation of suburbs, you start seeing the development of the middle class, the upper middle class, you see upward mobility and stuff. But what the article I was reading was kind of saying was that individuals who are African Americans and were redlining to a certain community, that's where COVID was really strong at compared to other different places. But redlining doesn't happen in the vacuum. So one of the things that you think about when you talk about redlining is the lack of resources, lack of good schooling, lack of uh, health care, lack of, you know, grocery stores, all these things happen in communities that have been redlined. So if you're growing up and you don't have an opportunity to go to the doctor, you don't have an opportunity for good physician care, that's something that kind of sticks with you, right? Because if I've never used it before, why would I start now? So, I mean, I think that's that's another component. And also it's this level of mistrust. Like I was preparing for today's episode, one of the things that we were just kind of, uh, that I was kind of reading on was that because it's like lack of African-American physicians, um, people don't always feel comfortable talking to the doctor. And, you know, you kind of see the schism that develops, right? Because sometimes if you're a physician, and I've seen this personally, 
you're not accustomed to working with people of color, what ends up happening is that it becomes my way or the highway. Um, and so when patients tell you like, hey, this is what's going on, and you never work with people of color, you don't have friends of people of color, like you just kind of went all the way through academia without seeing a brown face, that sometimes you can be dismissive of what people are telling you because this isn't something that you've experienced. Right? You went to the big name school, worked with the big name professors. Who's this person going to tell me about themselves, right? I'm, I know everything. And what ends up happening, people are like, you don't listen to me. I'm in pain. Things got worse. I'm not coming back. I had a slight ex similar experience. I had a male gynecologist tell me I didn't know anything about female bodies. Oh, that's the worst. It's like, I was where like, are seriously, these dude? From? <laughs> I'm like, uh, I think I have one. I might not have the medical knowledge on everything going on, but I'm fairly educated on how my system works. <laughs> and yeah, and I didn't go back to him because, I mean, I was early 20s and it was infuriating. I was like, you don't have a female body, so what you know you got from books, I what I know I got from living in one. Maybe the two of us together can figure out. I didn't have a problem. I was I pointed out that some things that were going on were different than other times. And, you know, I did use the term abnormal, but it's like, it's abnormal. It doesn't mean something's wrong. And he just dismissed me. So it's not necessarily just people of color, but... I was shocked that he would say something so stupid <laughs> and I can only imagine that it's worse when, you know, like obviously he probably had a, a little bit of a prejudice and I can only imagine what he, if I had been a black woman, Holy Toledo, that probably would have been a really ugly scenario. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but you know, it's something to think about though. Right. Because it's like, sometimes like you have this intersectionality, right. Of being an African-American woman and being a woman, and being African-American, like all these things just kind of converge on this, this one being and stuff. And like sometimes what you run into, because like not only am I a neuropsychologist, I'm in Utah, but you know, leading up to this point, I've done like a lot of community outreach and like people like open up and they tell you certain things. And so sometimes it's like, how do I express myself and being in pain, but without being seen as being confrontation, right? Because you're dealing with a group of people who's never really had confrontation before. So if somebody is assertive, they see that assertiveness as, oh, this is a conflict. They're challenging me. So the thing that I want to do is just get rid of them as quickly as I can, right? And if something bad happens, well, that's just medical or that's just science, that's just medicine, whatever the case may be. And it's like, no, it doesn't necessarily have to be like this, all right? So I think one of the biggest things is how do we focus diversity? Like, how do we push diversity? Because in medicine, there's this like this this mantra, almost, right? Like you know, uh, they just want peace, they just want uniformity, they just want all those things. But a lot of times, when you want this uh, vanilla lifestyle, vanilla whatever the case you want to call it, what ends up happening is like people of color usually get the short end of the stick to placate your soft ego, and that's not good, right? So then, when you put people in different environments, it's like, can you function? Can you do well? Um, I remember I was talking to this training director and he worked at one of the VAs um, that has like a majority black population. And he said something that was kind of interesting. He said something to the fact, like we get students and they come from the big name universities and they have these wonderful letters of recommendation and they work with these amazing professors. But the one thing that they don't have is experience working with people of color. What makes somebody a good clinician or a good physician is that they're able to draw from experience and make it applicable to like the research or whatever they do. And so what ends up happening is you get people who never work with people of color and they want to like try to rule with the iron fist, not realizing that you're supposed to help these people, not dominate these people. And it quickly turns into a mess. And he's like, I can only do so much before it looks like I'm just nitpicking or that I have a vendetta towards somebody, but it's about patient care. And that's one of the hardest things about medicine, or particularly psychology, neuropsychology, that's my thing, is because everybody wants to look distinct. Everybody wants to look like super duper professional. And they always recruit from like the big name places and stuff. And what ends up happening is that they get people who aren't capable of working with people of color. Those are some of the things that I've seen. One of the best suggestions I got recently would apply to that issue is 
one of the ways to heal the division in our country would be to reinstate like AmeriCorps and what, and basically have, um, what is that phrase? The like exchange students. So, a student from, you know, maybe a white or Hispanic student from San Francisco might go to West Virginia or, you know, somewhere in the Appalachians, which is really poor and obviously not at all like San Francisco, although I can't say that for certain because I haven't been there. And just, you know, like experience, you know, we, we have assumptions based on TV and books and social media, like, oh, those guys are just bumpkins and not educated and all. And I'm sure that's not true. But, you know, you're kind of ingrained into that thought. And so if you go and experience somebody else's way of life, especially as a teenager, I think that would really help blend our culture a little better, not change it so like, you know, well, we want the the country bumpkins to be more like the San Franciscans and the San Franciscans to be more, you know, just a better understanding is what I is probably a better term than blending and. You know what that reminds I, me of? Oh, I'm sorry. What? That was okay. No, I just, I really wish there was a way I could be like, hello, this is a really good idea. Somebody do this. <laughs> no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so two things. I remember when we were getting ready to take our SATs in high school, right? And we were all in Indianapolis, but not every school had like SAT where you could just take it. And so sometimes you would go to like a totally different school, like based off like where you lived in the city and different things. And you have an opportunity to see like how other high schools are set up. And sometimes you meet some of their students. And you'd be like, hey, these people are okay. I remember, um, man, like we, there used to be a school on the east side of Indianapolis, Arlington High School. My mom used to teach there. It was like a city school, whatever the case would be. And I remember like, you know, I, I did an SAT prep class because that was the only one that they had on Saturday during football season. <laughs> whatever the case may be. And so for so long, you always hear these stories and these myths about Indianapolis public schools. But then once you get around some of our students, you're like, man, these people are like really down to earth. They're funny. They're whatever the case may be. And it just kind of took down the barrier because some of these guys are around tracking like football with, and they were like, just really, you know, gracious and they're like, show me their circle and stuff. I definitely agree with you. And the second thing I was going to say was that it kind of reminds me of this show. I'm going to show my age, uh, Northern Exposure. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember that show? Like, I, I guess do. it was like a physician in New York and he moved out to Alaska to practice medicine. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like a culture shop, but he was able to like grow into like, you know, who he's supposed to be. Yeah, like I definitely agree with you. I think it matters. Like, I, I definitely think that it matters. And I think it's more than just saying, okay, you know, you grew up in South Dakota or Montana and now you're in Detroit. And you get this information and you leave the city of Detroit and you go back to where you came from. But it's like how do, the next step is like we get people here. We want the best of the best, not the most affluent or the most privileged. And how do we edify this community? Right. Because that's how people grow. It's like the continuity of care. Like you get people they are familiar with the community. They're really good with it. They ingratiate themselves in the community. And when they become a part of it, then they become invested in it. So they're not like pulling resources or knowledge then going back across country and stuff, and this community is left destitute. So that's the way I think things sometimes. I always, you know what, I, I like to read novels, and you always read about the, the country doctor who, you know, they live in a small town, which I live in a small city, and there's 70,000 of us, so I don't know how many quote-unquote country doctors we'd need for here, but they were part of the community. They knew their neighbors, the neighbors knew them, you know, it was like, they were just, it, they weren't separate. You know, nowadays it's like we're, before we started recording, I was talking about how my uh, diagnosis and treatment of shingles has been done all online through photographs and messaging. And I'm fine with that. Cause I really don't like to go to the doctor and right now still during COVID it's really not that great, but she doesn't know anything about me. So when I tell her, you know, like, holy crap, is it normal to have like really super horrible brain fog? Because I don't get brain fog. I would literally walk into the room and, you know, just this is my house. There's nothing overstimulating in my house. Everything is super familiar. I'd walk into the kitchen and be like, why did I come in here? I don't remember why I came in here. Now I'm going to go do something else. And I literally felt like I had mild cognitive impairment. She has no clue why that's a big deal to me. She and I never discussed it with her, but I would assume that it would get dismissed as, yeah, that's normal. 
Okay, are you sure? Because I got this like big family history of cognitive impairment. I would like to make sure that my brain didn't just take a dump, you know, <laughs> just poof. And it would, I would think it would, and I have been threatening this for several years and everything keeps upending it, but I would love to be able to establish a relationship with a doctor who understands that, you know, we don't have cancer in my family. So those things are not a concern. This is a concern and this is why. So when I tell you, I would like to, you know, because I will be 55 in November. And I think this is coming out after my birthday. It's coming out around that, I know. Um, You know, it's like, we're kind of getting to the stage where it's like, can we please start doing like a baseline cognitive test? So that if my husband says, she's having some daffy moments, they'll have like 55-year-old me baseline. And at 60 or 65... If there's a big change, then they would say, yeah, something's going on instead of, you know, taking forever to get diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia or whatever. Jen's just blonde and stupid today. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you raise an interesting point because, you know, that's something I used to see. Like I used to work in the suburbs of Chicago and it's really a fluent community. Right. And like sometimes we go like with the fluent community, people like really do their due diligence in terms of research and stuff. And individuals would hit that 50 year old birthday, 50 birthday. And what would end up happening is that they would just go in and they just want to get a cognitive test and stuff, right? And they would just take the initiative and do that. But I think it's a good point. I think that's something that we can all benefit from because sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And when you start thinking about like early onset Alzheimer's, that sort of happens around 55, 56, 54, which is a little bit more aggressive. And, it, and, it, and it's a thing. Like I know that's a little bit colloquial, but it's a thing that you really have to worry about because one of the things is like, how do I prepare for life after Alzheimer's or life with Alzheimer's? Like, and I don't think that's a conversation that's had enough because sometimes I don't, I don't think people really understand what Alzheimer's consists of, right? Because you meet some people and they're like, well, Alzheimer's, somebody can't find the keys or maybe they got a little bit confused and that's it. But it's like, no, it's a little bit more serious and it's only going to get progressively worse. So while the person's in the same mind, how do you plan your will? How do you plan how you're going to divide up your money? What are you going to move into an apartment or a townhome? Are you going to keep the house? Are you going to make the house safe? Like these are questions that a lot of people don't have. And then once it gets to a point where, you know, the person's no longer with us to a certain extent, then it's like, okay, well, what do we do? And now we have to go through these legal hurdles in order to have access to the state. And so I think I think it's something that's kind of mindful that people don't discuss enough. And I also think that sometimes people don't have access to care. It goes back to the access of care. And I'll delve into it a little bit because I don't want to dominate the conversation. <laughs> well, it's interesting you talk about planning. Obviously, for you know, for specific reasons, when we did our estate planning last year, Alzheimer's was a very big topic. What if this? What if that? And I have to, and I've said this before, the hardest question in the estate planning was when the lawyer looked at my husband and I and said, okay, well, you, every, your estate will go to your daughter. That's fine. That's typical. Uh, what happens if she goes first? And I looked at him and I went, well, that's an ugly question. Now she is engaged. Wedding is May 1st, 2022. Yay. Finally. It's like they keep postponing it. And, you know, there were some logical reasons for saying, ah, well, hmm, if she goes first, that leaves just the fiance slash husband. And there was some, I don't know how to put this. That doesn't sound horrible, but it was like, there was, we were overthinking some things. And one day the lawyer called, my husband said, Hey, we gotta, we gotta come up with an answer to this. He started right down that overthinking path. And I looked at him, I said, I'll be dead. I won't care. Give the money to Paul. I don't <laughs> care. Like it's that simple. I will be dead. I will not care. You know, cause he grew up very poor. He's got some siblings that make some really bad choices. So this is where sure. I'm talking about the overthinking, you know, like what if, you know, he gets our whole estate and his family does that, you know, you just start, <sighs> your brain is spinning. And like, I finally said, this is stupid. I'll be dead. I won't care if I have to come back and haunt him for making bad choices. Well, that might have to be a thing, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's what I tell people. I'm like, that was the hardest question. And when I realized I was overthinking it, it wasn't hard yeah. anymore. Well, the other thing, too, is 
my grandparents and my parents all wanted to live forever in their home. My mm. mom did not want to be a burden to her, her daughters, but she wanted to live forever in her home. Mutually exclusive decisions. And it was heart-wrenching to put her in memory care. It was the right choice. She had sure. friends. She did things that she would not do with me. It just was best for everybody, including her. But it wasn't easy because I knew I was going against what she wanted. So my husband and I are house hunting because it's not in our immediate area where he is a broker. Well, he is now um, registered up in where we're looking, but in the foothills, we're going to, it's going to be weird. I've lived in the San Francisco Bay Area my whole life, and now I'm going to be living in the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas. It's going to be a strange, strange way to talk about my life. But anyway. We're using a broker up there, and my husband does make the comment, this will be our last house until we have to move in, until, unless we have to move into assisted living. I have taken him from, I would want to live in my house forever, to understanding that assisted living is, to me, it's a place where, like, when you get to your 80s and you've been retired for a decade or more, why would you want to do the cooking and the cleaning and worry about the yard work? Even if you have a housekeeper and a landscaper, you still got to worry about, you know, we got dogs. It's a lot so of work. And, it is. Yeah. It's like, and where my mom lived, they had the healthiest, tastiest food. Like low sodium, but you never felt like you needed to pour the salt shaker on it. Just, it was really good. It was portion controlled, so you weren't overeating. I'm like... Yeah, I'll let somebody else worry about breakfast and I'll just worry about what the heck I want to do today. Uh, so that's my that's my um that's my advocacy for why the hell would you not want one of these places that takes care of all the worries so that you can just basically be like a teenager. Just well, it, enjoy it goes, life. <laughs> it goes into that medical mistrust. Like I think uh medical mistrust is like uh it, it's just something that's kind of interwoven in so many different things that we don't necessarily think about. Until it's time to like, we have to make a de make a decision. Um, I know just working with several people, like there's this concept like they can't take care of you as well as family, but you're not thinking about am I being a burden on family? And I think we kind of talked about this in previous episodes. We're not everybody's equipped to deal with like taking care of a loved, one, like an incapacitated loved one, right? Like not everybody's equipped to be able to give mom or dad a bath or feed or frustration, and sometimes. With, you know, people in my generation, like there's this level of upward mobility that hasn't really been seen before where more people are earning more cash and like their lives a little bit more fluid. Like it's almost from a bygone era where like just a whole host of family lives in the same community on the same side of town and stuff like that. More, more people like living across the nation and having different careers. And it's not easy just to like up and go and like say, OK, I'm going to come back and take care of mom or dad or whomever for like a month straight where it would be like if we lived in the same community, I could just go over there after work or whatever, you know. So it's so sick, this, this this mistrust where some people still want to be taken care of by family, but a lot of times family's not in a position just to really take care of somebody because, like, caregiver responsibilities are very taxing. Like, you know, if I'm taking care of somebody and they're getting progressively worse and other families, like, you know, we're going to pray for you or we're going to love you and stuff, like, I appreciate it, but that doesn't necessarily help me when I have to take mom out of the bathtub, right? And now I'm being isolated from a social standpoint, emotional standpoint, financial standpoint. I was reading an article where African-Americans were among the group of people who spend the most money in caregiving um, because they don't want to like use other services and like the amount of money that they use out of their own pocket is almost insane. It's, it's, it's an incredible amount of money, right? So what ends up happening is that now you're putting yourself in this financial uh, ruin. Yeah. Uh, I know some families, like, they almost went bankrupt because mom or dad, because I'm not trying to, you know, say anybody specifically, but, like, they lived a little bit longer than anticipated, right? Well, yeah, that's great that the person's around and you don't want to wish death on anybody, but at the same time, now it's just like, oh, they exhausted all their resources, but in order to accommodate their special needs, now we're using our resources and we got children who are in college or who are on the precipice of attending college. And, you know, if we can't help them with college, then they're going to have to take on student loans. 
you know, to take on student loans that's, that, that they have to account for, or maybe that might be a deterrent for them to go to college and stuff like that. So you see these residual impacts. So it's not just, okay, I want to take care of a loved one or whatever, but it's like, how are we going to do this caregiving experience? And a lot of times it kind of goes back to like working with African Americans where you don't have, you know, good resources in your community and some communities and stuff. Now you're forced to take this burden along. Now it becomes a little bit more taxing. Because it's like, okay, well, if we got to put you in assisted living care, well, we feel like this assisted living care place isn't going to be good enough. What are we going to do, right? We can't just kick you on the street and say, hey, thank you for everything. Bon voyage. You know? So, like, it becomes, like, super complicated. And these are the questions that need to be asked, which is also problematic because if you don't have a quality services in your community, then who do you talk to, right? So now you're making big decisions by yourself. Which is uh, which is taxing in of itself. Yeah, it's amazing. It just COVID definitely, I think, just blew open all the doors of what's what's wrong with our healthcare delivery system. I mean, it's definitely broken yeah, now. COVID exposed a lot of things. Like, which I hope will help speed up fixing a lot of things. But where I'm at, I I have there's a group of people in my life that. When California said, okay, we're going to reopen, you know, the mask mandate's going away, which that didn't last very long. It was like they literally just rocketed back to 2019. And I'm like, pump the brakes, folks. Some of us can't go back to 2019. You know, like I, I retired from one career, focus on, on other things. My mom died. You know, I don't live in the same house. You know, it's like my entire life is different. Yeah, there's parts of it. I wouldn't. There are days, you know, I'd like to go back to the what didn't seem simple then, but seems more simple now. I can't go backwards. So let's, um, you know, let's take the good things that we learned. You know, my Rotary Club abruptly stopped doing hybrid meetings, which I think is dumb because personally, you know, if you're in a service organization, it's generally older people. And there's been people that can't attend a meeting because they're recovering from a knee replacement surgery. You know, that's kind of a common thing, or it was, when you could actually get those done. And, you know, you might want to sit in your house and, and stare at your screen and, and at least be peripheral, peripherally, ugh, can't even say that word, part of a meeting that you can't attend because you can't drive and, you know, you didn't want to burden somebody by asking to pick you up or the person who was going to pick you up. Now they can't break, come for this. You know, it's just like hybrid meetings, you know, I know. Like, I don't like group Zooms. I like the Zooms like we're doing. But I wouldn't have minded, like, if I didn't feel good, stay home and just, like, you know, fire up the, the laptop and eat my lunch or my soup or sit in my sweats and feel icky and but still be a part of what's going on, still be, like, get firsthand knowledge. And Yeah, you know, so, that's... Oh, I was just going to say, you know, that's kind of interesting that you mentioned that because one of the things about COVID is that it just exposed, like, the fallacy of so many ideas, right? Like, the idea that I have to wake up before day, get to work by 8, and even if I have downtime from, like, maybe 3 to 5, I just have to sit at my job or for another two hours and stuff, be exhausted and fight traffic all the way back home because one of the things that we kind of learn with COVID is, like, you know, if I don't have anything to do at 8 and I don't have to be, like, at the hospital or be whatever until whenever, then so be it because production is still up. Like, cause I'm still doing the job or doing whatever I need to do. And, you know, I'm getting everything done. I just don't have to be there before time. I can prep for home or three o'clock, three thirty rolls around. And, you know, you don't want needless exposure and I could go home at three thirty. Well, you know what? I, mean, I don't have any kids, but you know, I could do chores or errands or whatever the case may be before went to five. And now I'm being more productive, not only at work, but in my own life. Um, but what COVID also did was to show like the importance of having social relationships, right? Because when you're no longer around people, you kind of realize how people make difficult things more tolerable. Where it's just kind of like, hey, you know what? I appreciate you being here. Like I appreciate our friendship more because I didn't realize how dependent I was on it. And COVID, because you weren't just needlessly at work, it gave you an opportunity because sometimes you get bored. But, hey, let me reach out to somebody who I haven't talked to in a long time. And let me reestablish this friendship. So no, I definitely understand your sentiments. Yeah, it's it's been interesting. It's I'm glad that I'm of an age where 
barring anything un, un terrible happening like Alzheimer's, I'll remember. I mean, how could I forget, you know, what this last two years yeah. has been like? I might it's want to forget. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, my paternal grandmother lived to be 103. And I think back on, you know, when she was born, that was during the Spanish flu <sighs> epidemic. And obviously she didn't remember that. But, you know, we didn't have, you know, airplanes and spaceships. And now we have civilians going into space that a robot is piloting the rocket. Sounds terrifying to me, but OK. Uh, they're up there. They're still OK. Coming down tomorrow. Uh, OK. Kind of different. You know, and it's like sometimes when I sit back and I think like when I started photography, it was on film and then I moved into you know, digital and I still have my DSLR, but you know what? I take really good pictures with my iPhone and the new iPhone. When I found out about it, I'm like, buy this now, <laughs> which is not yeah. at all like me. It has a built-in macro lens. I wouldn't have, I have a macro lens that screws onto my phone. Oh, it's just amazing. like, it blows my mind. Like my phone has more computing power than one of, than many of my earlier computers. So I'm just like, what is, what is the world going to be like? You know, when I'm 80 or 90 or 100, Lord, <laughs> that sounds like, a, you know, will we have doctors that make house calls? Because there's a lot of call for that. I would have paid pretty penny to have that for my mom. There are there are companies that do that. They just don't do them in the suburbs where most older people live, which hello, backwards. Yeah. Um, You know, it's just like what. This has been a very turbulent upheaval. Not such a great time, but I think there's going to be some really interesting changes. And so I'm kind of like, OK, I'm like excited Absolutely. to see what the changes might be. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's something I always ponder, too. Like, what is the future going to hold? Like, you know, uh, I look at some of my little cousins and they're so great with the TikToks and they're great with the social media. And I'm like, well, when I was 10, and I was just playing video games. Right. You know, now they're setting everything up. But just with respect to medicine, you said something kind of interesting, like with doctors making house calls. It's an idea that I toyed with, but something that I played with, you know, um, because there's this level of health disparity. Like, you know, I, you know, when I was in Chicago, I had an opportunity to work with several organizations. We were in like some really underserved communities, and they were always grateful for the help, even though I wasn't a doctor at the time. And something I said was like, man, I wonder, because you remember like when you were younger. Uh, you would see like the cartoons and the doctor would come to like the families and it'd be like raining outside and the doctor would just come to the rescue and stuff. And I was like, man, I wonder if I could do something like that with neuropsych. Like, let me come to your house and I can do the eval in the comfort of your own home. Because one of the problems that we run into in neuropsych is that you'll see a neuropsychologist either in a full suburb or in some medical research facility like downtown or someplace that's isolated from the rest of the community. And you start thinking about certain communities, like maybe like Detroit or South Side Chicago, or really any Rust Belt city where you have groups of African Americans who develop Alzheimer's at a rate that's three to four times higher than other groups of people. But it's like there's nothing that's really accessible to them. I'm saying, hey, maybe I could be that resource where I could say, hey, you know what, I'll come to your house and we'll do testing in the living room or whatever. And we could do it at your pace or whatever. And that way you can still receive services. Because what ends up happening is that when Things aren't there. It's kind of like when a big tree burns down, you start seeing other paths emerge, right? So it's like, if I'm not here, what's going to start emerging? And one of the things that I find that emerges is people have questions. Like, what's the what? Like, what's the point of me taking two trains and a bus or two buses and a train to either go to some medical facility downtown or go super far out to the suburbs? And you're going to tell me something that I already know. Yes, mom has Alzheimer's or uncle had had a stroke and he can't do whatever. Well, I say, like, well, neuropsychology is a little bit bigger than just telling you like the obvious, like we give treatment recommendations and tell you the trajectory of like, you know, the psychopathology or the cognitive impairment or whatever. So there's like a really special realization why you should come see us. And I was just thinking like, like maybe I could be that boy that goes to like different people's homes and stuff. And like, I can provide the service that's not really there. And that way we can still push mental health awareness. That makes sense. And one of my other regular guests, Dr. Mucci, who is a geriatrician mm -hmm. in the UK, she went and visited a gentleman in his home because he was having a lot of falls and she couldn't figure out why. 
And when she and I was shocked that even in the UK, a doctor would go to somebody's house. He was a retired antiques dealer. His home was very interesting. It was not my style, but he had lots of rugs, uh, one rug over another rug. And oh, instead wow. of a, you know, a side table, it might be a stack of old books and suitcases. So very nice looking, but not very stable if you trip and sure. you, you reach out to but catch yourself on this stack of books that falls down. And she posted it on her Instagram story. Said, How many rugs did you see? Well, I caught five out of the six. <laughs> and she is very big on, she's, she's like a medical detective. It's, if you're not following her on Instagram, you totally should. It's um, <laughs> doctor spelled out dot Elena Mucci. You can find her through me. And she, other doctors have missed things because they don't like strip somebody down to their underwear, which, you know, if you don't think you need to do it, I can understand. Like nobody wants to sit there in front of a stranger in their nakedness. They're like, I don't want to do that. And, you know, but she has discovered issues with people because she's giving them a full head to toe exam. And to me, those two things, like understanding what their environment is like, because again, when I see stories from other caregivers like on Instagram and stuff. And I see just, you know, they their loved one might have like mild agitation that just drives them bonkers. Sure. And I'm looking in the background going, I would have mild agitation if I had to live with all that crap all over the counters, which <laughs> is a very common thing. Most people have way too much crap on their counters. I do not because I am a neat freak. It stresses me out to have clutter. So I'm <laughs> Not a clutter person. Sure. And, you know, it's like all of that stuff is stimulating and confusing. If your brain is not processing things right, I look at that as a big problem. Now, it may or may not be what's causing their agitation. They might just be totally comfortable with crap everywhere that I'm not. But if I were a doctor or like you, a neuropsychologist, to me, those are big clues. And going into their environment, you might be able to say, you know, reducing the amount of paperwork and stuff that you have on the on the counters here or on this bookshelf over here why don't we try and see if just simplifying things visually might help them feel less more more calm i don't know that's just my my no, two cents absolutely. <laughs> yeah i mean but you know it's like taking like a it's like taking a huge approach right where you kind of see like what can i fix what is wrong why is there something wrong and that's the approach that I take, right? Like starting from the super obvious is something that's like maybe a little bit minuscule. And if somebody has like a junky home, like not only is that a hazard that they might fall, particularly if they struggle like walking around and moving and different things of the sort, but also like it's the dust, it's an allergen, is it causing them to cough and sneeze? Is it disrupting their breathing and stuff like that? So what can we do to like make it clean? Uh, make a pathway like small things matter like uh, I learned nothing else in neuroscience like small things matter right so even if you get a person to come in to kind of organize clean the house or whatever and you're reducing the amount of allergens perhaps that's a path to a solution um you know just just yeah so I agree with you like just moving the clutter and stuff making sure that they don't fall like you know and as the brain degenerates they may become agitated they may become jocular that might be something that's not avoidable but what is avoidable is moving stuff out of the way so they don't trip or fall, or sometimes they become so cluttered and stuff, you start getting vermin that comes in, and that's never a good thing. Um, you know, if they have trouble cleaning their house, I mean, granted, like, there's a gradient of why clutter gets there, but to a certain extent, like, if they have trouble cleaning the house, or they're eating nutritious food, or they're throwing away old food, or they're eating Ooh, that is spoiled. Like, do they have an upset stomach? Is that why they're irritated? Remember, like, I used to be an ABA therapist, applied behavior analysis, or I used to work with autistic children. And sometimes you would work with children who are nonverbal, and you know, sometimes they would have um, it's a, uh, it's I forget, I forget the name of it, but it's a type of stomach disorder where if they eat too many too many things and stuff, it, it gives them like acid reflux. It really makes their tummy hurt, like. Long story short, but sometimes they come verbalized and they'll eat too much candy or eat something that was like really spicy and it would just really flare up and you would just see this agitation. And so you, you say like, why is somebody agitated? What am I not seeing? 
that's making this person agitated and that we can easily fix. Because it's not about the length of life to a certain extent, but it's about the quality of life. Definitely. And if somebody why, new comes into your space, they're going to see things that we just tune out because we don't have a place for all of this paperwork or like our best friend is a scientist and she swears that she knows where everything is in these piles of papers. And I look at the piles of papers and just basically want to scream. And yeah, it, it takes like her longer to find things than it does for me. I'm like, even my craft supplies, super, super organized. I could probably grab what I need in 10 seconds with my eyes closed because they're all in the same place. And it's, well, you know, that's, it's interesting. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, well, it just makes life easier that I don't have to think about, you know, this goes in this drawer, this goes in this one, this goes here, boom, done. I don't have to. Th it's just like a habit. And I don't understand people that don't do that, but I do understand people are different. So I don't I don't try to organize other people. <laughs> well, you know, what? I lead this cognitive remediation program at Utah State Hospital. So the one of the things with cognitive remediation is that, you know, we teach compensatory skills and we, and we teach restorative skills depending on where the person's at with their cognitive impairment. And so one of the things that I tell the clients is that organization is key because frustration is like a natural part of life. We all become frustrated. But the thing is, is like some people can't manage frustration, right? Some people are like, okay, I become frustrated, or that sucks, and they can let it go, move on where the case will be. And other people, when they become frustrated, they have like a total meltdown where they're no longer able to function. From that point, they become frustrated Everything else is like, it doesn't work. And so organization is key because even if you have some sort of cognitive impairment, you can still say, my keys are always going to be in this basket on the counter, right? Or my shoes are always going to be underneath the bed, or my glasses are always going to be on the nightstand or whatever the case may be. So it doesn't matter if it's rainy, snowy, whatever the case may be, you can just grab and go. But when you think about somebody where they can't find something and they start becoming more frustrated, then it's less about finding the object that you're looking for unless you just don't want it. And it's more about frustration management and those individuals who cannot manage frustration, it just ruins the whole day. And one of the things that kind of just like makes frustration worse, is like lack of productivity, right? Because you just wasted four hours, you just wasted five hours or six hours. So organization is so key because even impairment, it allows you to have some sibilance of function. Mm hmm. I agree with that. I mean, I've had dogs all my life and dogs, they don't have long term memory. They just sure. they um, their memory is like pattern. So when you change the pattern kind of throws them off. Now I got one dog that handles it just fine. We went on a three week road trip in a trailer. She was thrilled. The other dog was like, what the hell did you do to my life? I don't understand. I'm confused. I'm okay because you're with me. But eh. I mean, you could kind of see mild anxiety in him. Now he's a rescue. So his first seven months of life were not great. So that's also an issue. But you could see that the way they handled it was very different. It was very interesting. But it's kind of, to me, it's kind of the same thing. It's you need to. If you're dealing with a cognitive impairment or taking care of somebody with a cognitive impairment, you need to keep things as simple and easy as possible so that you can just kind of move from one task to the other. Like I know caregivers who lay out uh, activities in, you know, like coloring books will be on the kitchen table and snacks will be on the, the island in the kitchen and there might be magazines to thumb through next to their favorite chair because it's because they can just, oh, it's it's there and they can just handle it. So they can they can be a little bit more independent because you've set it up easily for them. And that to me is it equates to being organized. And we like totally went off the topic today, but this has still been really well, interesting. It's, it's so I mean, I think it, I think it's some valuable information I think that people can use. Um, you know, I think I think it's I think it's really useful. I mean, I mean, I think we talk about organization. I think that's something that like People appreciate, but they don't always know how to do it. They don't, there's something that they don't think of because like, when you're dealing with like a loved one who is dealing with the cognitive impairment, like it's calamity, right? A big part of your life is calamity because you're organizing and one or not organizing, but you're trying to manage this. And one best step to lead to more calamity, right? This might break a leg, break a hip, break an arm, have a traumatic brain injury. Does it get worse? Are they now hospitalized? And that's a lot of guilt to bear. But I think there's power in organization because one of the things that it just allows you to do is just it allows you to 
uh, you know, fine tune your schedule. Uh, I, t- I tell my patients this also, it's a little bit sidebar, but not really, but like, it's not about eliminating distractions, right? Because we had this thing, uh, it's called leap skills. Like when you're trying to teach somebody how to like pay attention when you talk, you listen actively, you eliminate distractions, you ask questions, right? Um, but you can't really eliminate the distractions because let's say once we in this interview and you want to go to Walmart, either somebody's going to text you, somebody's going to call you, somebody's going to need something for whatever the case may be. And whether major or minor, it's still going to be a distraction. But when you allocate enough time that even if there's something that's impeding on your schedule, you still have an opportunity to not only take care of what you set out to do, but you are able, you're in a position where you can handle the distraction and you're still able to find productivity, right? Productivity is key. The other thing too about being very organized is you're, if you're an organized person like me, like There's a past guest. She's one of the founding mothers of All's Authors. Her book was manifested out of the notebooks that she kept while she was not caring so much for, I mean, she was taking care of her parents, but not caregiving like we think about it with Alzheimer's. But she had been noticing changes and and some, um, not what's the right word, but just changes that were disturbing. And she was make because her sister was like a thousand miles away in another state. She was making notes. So like, you know, today is September 17th, blah, blah, blah. This is what happened. And so she had notes that she could take to the doctor. So she didn't have to rely on her memory. Well, I think it was in September sometime mom did X. And then because basically what ended up happening is both her parents were diagnosed with Alzheimer's on the same day. Oh, that must have been fun. Yeah, but it wasn't surprising and it wasn't as devastating as it could have been because she had a notebook full of information and other people have added on and said, you know, if you see them doing something like maybe mom, like my mom walked totally fine until she fell and broke her leg, didn't need walking aids. But if my mom had started like shuffling her feet, that would have been a clue. And I have learned from all the wonderful guests that I've had, I would have taken a video of her to show the doctor because if they're not in your space observing what you're observing, which obviously they're not going to be with you 24 hours a day, and you're telling them, well, mom's always walked fine, but now she's shuffling her feet. They're interpreting that through their lens. And if your information is spotty because you're trying to rely on your own memory, you know, it's just you're you're making it more difficult for them to do their job. So it's to me being organized, making notes on what's going on, like with yourself, with um, your loved one. Cause like dealing with the shingles, like I don't get sick. And if I get sick, it's usually pretty mild. So basically being uncomfortable for two and a half months was not fun. And it literally affected my mental health. My husband finally figured out, he's like, okay, Angry Jen is coming. Oh, good. Now we're crying too. Good Lord. Why are you in pain? Oh, okay. Yeah. Got it. I mean, it was so frustrating and I, and I knew what was going on, but I couldn't stop it. I couldn't stop getting irritated at the dumbest thing or, or crying at the dumbest thing. Cause it's just like, my body was just done. You know, I had no energy and I was constantly uncomfortable, but all of that was way out of the norm for me. So like if it had continued, He could have started taking notes and he could have gone to the doctor and said, I don't know what the hell's going on, but please fix this before I kill her. (laughs) And, you know, it's just it's to me, we have to. Unfortunately, with our system, we have to do kind of a lot more of the detective work, a lot more of the like secretarial work on, hey, the you know, she was fine. She got shingles. Now she's like a raving lunatic. I don't understand. (laughs) The dog is hiding from her. You know, these are all. People, you know, they're we need to be able to tell doctors what's going on and how it's affecting everybody, I think, to give them a bigger picture. That's you know, that's such a good point though. But you know, it's kind of twofold because like when I was preparing for this interview, like something I ran into is like it's like this level of mistrust. I know we kind of talked about a little bit earlier, but representation matters, right? Because sometimes what ends up happening, and I'm not trying to cast aspersions on any particular group positions, but this is sometimes what you see. Like there was even an article, I think maybe like four or five, six years ago, University of Virginia, a prestigious medical school, they 50% of the students 
felt that African Americans had a higher pain tolerance. Like right? they felt that uh, African Americans, you know, they could do more extraneous things to them because they could handle it, which isn't true. And this is when you start seeing like all the birth deaths and you know all the complications during pregnancy and during hospital visits and stuff. But representation matters. And what they kind of found is that when um, African American doctors have African American patients, that the amount of information that they get is a little bit more richer, or the suggestions that they make to the patients, patients are more inclined to follow up because it's not necessarily just talking about, okay, you have diabetes or whatever, but it's also saying, how are you holistically? Like, how's your life? Are you kids in college? You know, what are you thinking about? What are your fears? What are your concerns? And because there's a level of familiarity, then you're usually able to provide better patient care and the patients are more likely to come back. Like representation matters. And sometimes when uh, the physicians don't necessarily match the patients, what ends up happening is like you have this huge, massive disconnect, right? And sometimes you see the physician say, oh, this patient is really loquacious. Is there some sort of uh, frontal disexecutive functioning going on? And why are they, you know, talking so much? And Or sometimes it's like, hey, you know, I went to this big prestigious school, so they're not listening to me. They're saying there's something else. They don't know because I went to a big name university or whatever the case. And what ends up happening is that patient care doesn't, is not maximized, I should say. So, you know, representation matters. And like just being a good physician is saying like, okay, like we just kind of talked about with distractions and having an allotment of time. When I see this person, I'm going to give them 15, 20 minutes because that's all I have. That's not my fault, whatever. But I'm going to make these the best 15, 20 minutes that I can make it. And I'm going to ask all the pertinent questions, right? And sometimes it takes like ancillary research. So you know who you're working with. You're knowing the population that you're working with. So you know the right questions to ask. Like when I was at Emory, Emory, we were like ridiculously busy for like advanced practicum. And one of the things that helped is like, okay, understanding the group of patients that I'm working with. So I know how to get the right answer. So I know how to you know, get the right information so I can build a case for whatever diagnosis this is, right? Because I'm not going to take this one size fits all. Okay, well, this is a Black person from South Georgia and they have diabetes, uh, so it must be some sort of story. No, let me do my due diligence and answer the right questions. So that way, whatever we come up with, this is going to be a good answer. So whoever, doc, whatever doctor or whatever the case may be who sees this report next, we can like continue to build off of this. And like, that's what makes good neuropsychologists and that's what makes good clinicians and good physicians and stuff. But sometimes, like, when you work with people, they just have these poor social skills. And they're always thinking, like, oh, this person is just trying to talk, this person is trying to whatever. But it's like, no, we're not trying to be buddy-buddy, but we're trying to establish rapport so we can get the best information in the amount of time that we have available. Which is not usually enough. I almost think that they could... Um either pre-screen through forms that asks more detailed questions that might almost feel a little bit invasive, or they could have a physician's assistant, not necessarily a PA type physician's assistant, but somebody assigned to collecting this information so that the, and then of course I know doctors don't have enough time to read charts because before this episode airs is one on, how to actually advocate for your own health care. And she gave very specific tips and suggestions. So I learned that medical charts are not chronological and they're not necessarily, they're not organized the way I would do them. So, <laughs> but you know, if somebody, cause I'm thinking like our system isn't set up to do what you're talking about and we need to move that way. Unfortunately, those massive kinds of changes don't happen quickly they're painful while you're going through all those changes. Nobody wants to deal with that. So it's going to be a long time. It probably will not happen in my lifetime, even though I will be around for another 45 years. And, you know, but I'm thinking if somebody could, instead of saying, have you had any of these diseases? Like I can almost go, no, no, you know, just like, I don't even have to read it. Sometimes I scan it just to make sure I don't answer no to anything different by, by accident. But, it's like, yeah, I, a, I don't get sick. So maybe you should like, that should push me or push questions about me in a different direction. Like, what are your health concerns? Why are you here today? Oh, you don't feel normal? Okay, th 
you don't normally get sick so and you don't feel it. So something must be going on. Somehow we need to figure out a way of helping doctors get that information without saying, yeah. okay, doctor, spend an extra half an hour with me. <laughs> um, you know, it's so interesting because I, I know, because I was at Wasatch Mental Health before I started the post op and so some kid, like especially if they were like in southern Utah or maybe someplace that wasn't necessarily close, sometimes we would send like the pre-screening information. Sometimes we would email it and they would figure it out or they would fill it out. But you get like a different level of information, like when you're face to face or when you're in person and stuff like that. And what it is, I don't it, it's like your body language says a lot. Like, you know, and I'm not gonna keep talking about this Kagrim program that I'm leading at the Utah State Hospital. But it's like, how do I show you that I'm engaged? Like, I want to know information about you, right? Because some people, you know, they let other things impact the way that they do patient care. Like, I come across it, like, or somebody could come across and they look like they're busy or they're tired or they're uninterested, right? Like, if I show you that I don't care what you're saying and what we're doing is a formality, more than likely, you're not going to keep talking to me about what's going on because you don't think that I value it, right? Or so... It's teaching physicians to say, put on your acting face, even if you are tired or don't care. Show the person that you do care, particularly in psychology and stuff like that. Um, show them that you do care, you know, knowing what questions to ask leads to more information that you can choose from. Like, and that's like really an important thing. Um, and sometimes it's about having a level of familiarity. Like, uh, I remember, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, when I was doing my advanced practicum at Emory, I had an opportunity to work with uh, Dr. Monica Parker, who is an absolute gem. Like, she is incredible. And one of the things that we would do is that we would go around to different African-American churches in Atlanta, where the churches were, and me, Baptist, Methodist, um, Catholic churches, um, you know, just whatever the case may be, Seven Day Adventist Church, like we would be there. And what we would do is like we would do like these presentations to kind of raise awareness about Alzheimer's. And there was a component where we would do like these pre screening measures, kind of like what we were talking about a little bit before. And I think we would give like the mocha, right? So basically, if you get like somewhere between a 27 and 30, that means that you're functioning well cognitively. But like if you get like a, anything less than 27, that kind of means that you're in a precipice of cognitive impairment. Although data kind of shows now, I'm looking at African Americans, instead of it being like 27 out of 30, it should be around 25 out of 30, so you don't misdiagnose people. But the point is, is that African American women will see me, and Dr. Parker was always just like, Chris, you're unique because you're still young, you're African American male, you attended a historically black college university, you're part of a divine nine fraternity, which is like Kappa Alpha Psi. So you have all these things that resonates with the people who we're working with. And what ended up happening when I was working with Dr. Monica Parker was that, you know, some of the parishioners of whatever church we would be at who were women, they would see me, they'd have a little bit of conversation, and they would almost break their necks to tell their husbands and their brothers and whomever Hurry up to the church because there's somebody that's just like you where you can relate to them that's going to do some cognitive testing, right? And so sometimes what you see in like collectivistic communities is that, you know, if the matriarch or the family says, this is what we're doing, then the whole family comes out, right? So it's finding a way to reach the matriarch. And when the matriarch trusts you and say, wow, you know, you're good, we trust you, you're respectful, you're familiar with our culture. Now we're going to have the family come in and stuff. And we were able to get like over 300 participants. And a lot of these participants were male just because they had an opportunity to see uh, me. And I'm not saying that like braggadocious, but what I'm saying is that representation matters. Um, a lot of things that we did in Atlanta community, like uh, when I hosted an event and we would go from home to home to home to home, just kind of saying, hey, we're doing this thing at the church. Uh, please come through. And when you're able to do like a makeshift, seminar talk in front of these people's lawn and they'll say all right well come to the backyard we're having a barbecue and do your speech again right so now you're talking to different groups of people and it's the ability to be available is what makes a difference right because when people trust you and you're a part of the community rather than just saying hey, i'm dipping my foot in and i'm going to go back to the side of town people are more inclined because they say if something happens you're not going anywhere and we can figure this out and just one last story i i, I um participated in MCOR, Michigan Center, Michigan Center Urban for African-American Aging Research. 
is affiliated with University of Michigan. And one of the things that they were saying was like, hey, we got a billion dollar endowment, but we can't recruit Black Detroit because we don't have the bandwidth of individuals who work with us to be able to consistently go in these communities and stuff. So it's like representation and availability matters because when people become comfortable with you, that's when you start having the good conversation. That's when the conversations change from like yes and no responses to, hey, I've been experiencing this or I've been going on through this. So it's one of those things also where African-Americans, um, you know, like when you start thinking about <laughs> that's a janitor. Uh, so it's one of those things that you're thinking about is like when you see a perversion of healthcare, where it's like, okay, it's a white physician and she's being standoffish. And I grew up in the rural South and I think about Emmett Till or the Scottsboro Boys or what or Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Rice, whatever the case may be. And it's because I was falsely accused by a woman that I did something that I didn't. And now that, you know, I'm having diabetes or hypertension and, you know, my genitals aren't working like the way that I normally that they normally do, and I'm supposed to show them to her. Like that's antithetical to the way that I was raised, right? When you have somebody that reflects you, then it's more of a conversation where you can talk about the illness that's, that's happening. So, I totally believe it. we have to figure out how to make that happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, give me a job once I finish this post doc. I think that's the first. Thing. <laughs> Well, I keep telling you, I'm in the middle of all these right now, you know, between UCSF and Stanford and UC Davis. And, you know, there's all kinds of great university hospitals out here. I don't know what you want to do when you're done with that. When, how much more time do you have left? Uh, the countdown has started. I only got like 10 months before I'm done with the postdoc. So uh, I'll, I'll be on a job hunt in a little bit. You know, like just just trying to see what's what what else is out there. Uh, I mean, Utah's been good to me. Um, I don't know if this is forever, but you know, I'm definitely just playing my options to just try to put myself in the best position. Um, I had an opportunity to go up to Detroit like maybe a week ago for um, their Labor Day Jazz Fest, and granted, the Jazz Fest moved to like online, but it was just an amazing experience, and I got a chance to hang out with like some family who I haven't seen since my grandmother passed in like 2018, and it was just like, man, like you just kind of see like an opportunity that's here. I mean, they got like these prominent neuropsychological facilities downtown. They got a couple of things in the suburb, but it's like the rest of the city that's 80% African-American, 630,000 people. And it's just like, what can I do with that? Um, I mean, but I mean, these are just scenarios I kind of think about. I mean, I fell in love with Chicago and I did so much community outreach in terms of Alzheimer's awareness in the city of Chicago. I thought like, man, you know, maybe there's a chance where I can like, kind of like, you know, reap the seeds that I've sold like years ago. Um, I mean, Dallas was just a good time. I just, <laughs> just enjoyed Dallas. Dallas, Texas was uh, phenomenal. Um, but, you know, Utah, you know, I'm just kind of like working and everything's going in the right direction. So, I mean, it's just some real life decisions that's in front of me. And it's just some things I have to kind of figure out. I'm a Midwest guy. You know, my mom's getting a little bit older. Um, don't want to be closer to home. Do I want to live my own life? You know, I mean, it's just like little things that you kind of think about as you progress. Yep. It's amazing. I thought life got easier. I less less yeah. dramatic questions to answer. And I can guarantee you that doesn't happen. So, <laughs> well, now we've put it out there in the universe. Christopher will be looking for a job in like, I think when this comes out about eight months. So maybe somebody knows something and they can contact me and, and they can, they, they should be able to find you through me easily too. So you never know. We've made, know, we've right? might yeah, manifest I mean something cool. I know UC Davis, they have this interesting research where they're looking at African Americans and stuff. Uh I forget the re I forget their research program specifically, but I was like, oh man, that's kinda that's kinda cool. So I don't know. We'll we'll see what the future holds. Um we'll see like a crapshoot. I know, <laughs> right? Spin the wheel. <laughs> find, find out where you're gonna end up. Yeah, because where we're going, you know, was never ever, ever a consideration. And then the friend said, Oh, we're gonna probably move up here. And I was devastated because I'm like, well, great. You know, like my social life got blown up with COVID and now my best friends are going to move an hour and a half away. This is not cool. And now we're going up there and it opened up a whole opportunity that I didn't know existed. So it's like being open to opportunities is helpful, too. And, you know, you just never know which way life's going to take you. If we didn't learn that last year that, you know, some invisible virus can just upend the entire globe. Well, 
I have no hope for you to learn these things. <laughs> so I know you have to run back out to the hospital. This yeah. has been a fantastic conversation. Absolutely. I'll let you get back to work and then maybe you can enjoy your weekend. Fingers crossed. No, it's going to be a busy weekend. I got so much work I got to do this weekend, but I'm going to find some way to enjoy it, though. That's that's for sure. What's the weather like in Utah right now? Uh, it's like 86 fall. degrees. Um, I don't know. Same here. Yeah, it's like 86 degrees. It's hot, but it's not as hot as it has been. Um, so I don't know. Hopefully I get on a bike, ride around the town a little bit, you know. Get some yep. party, man. We've been doing that a lot because after 13 months of waiting, my husband finally got his road bike. In, mm -hmm. Well, it came in July while we were on our road trip. And then when we got home, he picked it up and it's like he's losing weight because he's riding more. Just, you know, just one little simple change makes a bet, you know, improves your life. So Absolutely. that's kind of what all these conversations are about. Might spark an idea to make one simple change that makes things better. Uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Like riding a bike and doing boxing classes have been like amazing for me. So. Awesome. Well, I will let you get back to work and I appreciate this. Absolutely. I appreciate you too. We got to do this again. Definitely. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.